All right, so welcome everybody to uh, our workshop on fellowship and grant writing in the humanities and social sciences. Um, I know we the title slide here says humanities, but uh, social scientists are more than welcome and recognize that there's often a lot of overlap and uh, what you all can apply for. So we're happy to have everybody here who is here. I am Dr. Keith McCall. I am the assistant director of the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards, and I'm joined by my entire team today, including our director, Dr. Adrian Stevenson, and our graduate assistant, Honorine uh, Royer. So glad to have everybody here. And we also have uh, three panelists, but I will introduce them before we begin the panel discussion. So the way this workshop is going to go, the format for today is I'm going to begin a presentation that is going to go through a number of different award mechanisms that graduate students in humanities and social sciences um, at least should consider. And also keep in mind that all of these that I'm going to go through are examples, and there's probably others that do a similar thing out there. So this is not an exhaustive list. It is a list to give you ideas of the type of types of funding that are out there that you may want to consider in your graduate career. We'll also discuss a few sort of best practices for application preparation and things to keep in mind as you are thinking about moving from searching for funding to actually applying for funding. And then we'll pause uh, for Q&A at that point, and then we'll begin the panel discussion. So while we are going to pause for Q&A, please feel free to drop questions into the chat at any point. We will either get to them as we see them, uh, if they're relevant and should be answered right away. Um, and if not, we'll hold them for those Q&A sessions. But Throughout both this for first portion of the presentation and once we get to the panel discussion, uh, please ask questions as they arise. Okay, so there are a whole lot of different funding mechanisms out there for students to apply for. And just about the only thing that we don't really do at the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards to support you in finding those things is to actually find them for you. Uh, so instead, we try to give you the knowledge and the tools that you need to go out and do your own funding search, and then we'll support you throughout that application process. But I think very often, um, in part, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this workshop, we got a lot of requests for a um, humanities-specific workshop. My own, my own PhD is in humanities field, and Honorine uh, is in humanities as well. And we know that there's often a perception out there that there just isn't that much funding for the humanities. Certainly compared to STEM students, I think humanities students can often feel um, either like they aren't going to be competitive for some things that are open to humanities and social science students as well as people in STEM, um, or that the things that are humanities specific are so competitive that they're not going to be, uh, it's not really worth applying for things like a NEH grant. Um, so hopefully we'll be, we dispel that a little bit today and show you that there actually is a lot out there for humanities students and there's a lot out there to support you through your graduate career. There are specific funding mechanisms for just about every different thing you might want to do in your graduate career from just sort of general funding for your coursework and research uh, in the form of fellowships and scholarships to things that are aimed specifically at writing and researching your thesis or your dissertation, whether you're a doctoral student or a master's student. There's also lots of different travel awards out there from short term travel that can get you to somewhere like a library or an archive or out in the field to do ethnography. Uh, to longer term opportunities that could send you abroad to do more involved research projects abroad or to do language training programs abroad as well. And there's also a lot of different residential fellowships uh, for people in the humanities, and I think sometimes these also are things that can fall off the radar for graduate students. Um, and I know sometimes they purposely fall off our radars because you think, well, I don't necessarily want to go have to live somewhere else for a year, uh, but there can be great opportunities and they aren't all long term residential fellowships. So, We'll discuss a couple of those. So I want to start with just some of the ones that are uh, more broad and some of the kind of common and major awards that humanities and social science students might want to consider. So the Institute for Humane Studies has a number of different award mechanisms. The one that's probably most relevant for graduate students is what they call the graduate graduate sabbatical grant. And it is basically a sort of release from your other it, you know, it pays your stipend so that you aren't um, working as a TA, GA, or RA for a semester or two. Uh, its focus is on what they call classical liberal ideas, but they seem to construe that fairly broadly. If you can make an argument for how your work deals with, um, you know, things like democracy, rule of law, civil society, you can probably make an argument for why you fit with the IHS. 
The Mellon ACLS Dissertation Innovation Fellowship is a new award mechanism first being offered this year. Uh, it has replaced the Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellowship. So unfortunately, if you're farther along the program, you've lost out on a dissertation completion fellowship that a lot of people applied for. Um, but it's now been replaced by one that if you are earlier in your graduate career, you should strongly consider. It uh, basically wants to fund you in that first year of transitioning from coursework to dissertation. And it provides something like $40,000 in a stipend, plus another uh, $8,000 in funding for professional development, mentorship, and research. So it's a pretty major uh, award program. These are two that are a little bit more topic specific. The Charlotte Newcomb Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship uh, is basically a completion fellowship for your dissertation writing. So it wants to fund you in that last year of your dissertation writing. There are a number of different awards out there. I said the um, Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Award went away. Unfortunately, the Social Science Research uh, Institute also got rid of their Dissertation Completion Award. And we've heard recently that Ford will be um, phasing theirs out by 2025. So while the Charlotte Newcomb still exists and the Woodrow Wilson Dissertation Fellowship still exists, there might be a sort of broader shift going on right now to um, move away from dissertation completion fellowships. So something to keep in mind, but if you fall into work that uh, has some engagement with either religious or ethical concerns, the Charlotte Newcomb is probably a good one for you to consider. And you can see in this third bullet point on this one that, um, again, they have a fairly broad way of thinking of the different things that could fall into their areas of interest. The Woodrow Wilson Dissertation Fellowship in Women's Studies is uh, not as major of an award as the Charlotte Newcomb. It's only 5,000 instead of 30,000, but it provides you uh, sort of necessary funds to complete that dissertation. So if you find that, you know, you, you know you need a little bit of additional research, um, it could step in and provide you that $5,000 toward that additional research. And it is specifically interested in people in, who are engaging um, women or gender in their dissertation. So uh, remember, gender is, of course, broader than women. Um, but you can be doing something that falls into either of those fields of study. Now, these are a couple that I, uh, I think graduate students in humanities and social sciences often don't realize they are eligible for. So the Ford Predoctoral Fellowship, again, this will be being phased out by 2025, but it still exists for now and uh, will exist for the next three years. They'll still be taking cohorts. Uh, as far as we know, they'll be taking a cohort for 2023, 2024, and then 2025 is a little bit of a question mark. It provides three years of funding at $27,000 a year, and it is for anybody in a research-based doctoral program. So if you are in a discipline that will lead to a PhD, if you have to write a dissertation, you are eligible to apply for the board, uh, although it is restricted to US citizens. There are also a number of different things in the, within the National Science Foundation that um, I really think is something humanities and social science students, probably social science students a little less because some there are some uh, social science fields that fall specifically into the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Um, but a historian won it last year, uh, somebody who just made an argument for how they use social science methodology. They don't fall into the fields actually enumerated in social science for the NSF GRFP, but they made an argument for how their traditional uh, humanities-based discipline is engaging enough social science methodology that they were able to win that fairly major fellowship, which provides uh, three years of funding over a five-year period. The National Science Foundation also has a department, um, a program for science and technology studies. It's a growing field that more and more um, humanities and social science students are engaging in. So if you do anything with STS studies, or, well, that's repetitive. If you do anything with um, science and technology studies, you should look into that, uh, that opportunity. And we'll send everybody this presentation after, we'll send a follow-up email after this workshop. Everything in here is linked, hyperlinked, and we'll take you directly to that fellowships website. If you do anything where it makes sense for you to go get additional language training, uh, there are a couple award mechanisms that will provide funding and the opportunity to do that. The Boren is a fairly major fellowship. It um, provides long-term cultural immersion and language training, somewhere between 25 to 52 weeks, and they have a preference for that long, you know, toward the longer uh, 
length. So they would prefer that you go for 52 weeks rather than 25. For graduate students, they can provide you up to $30,000 and you basically design your own program for language study abroad. So they have a number of, um, you know, BORN doesn't operate in every country and it doesn't uh, work with necessarily every language. So you can't go to study um, a Western European language basically, or you can't go to Canada on a BORN. And Spanish is going to be a harder argument because they know that Spanish is widely available at most universities and you could just take Spanish at Florida State. So um, not every language will be supported by Boren, but if you fall into a language that is supported by Boren, it can be a very strong program to do that. And as a graduate applicant for the fellowship, the Boren Fellowship, you can also be doing your own research project on the side. So you could go and do language training while you're also doing research in country. Um, now the downside for Boren for some people is that it does require at least a year a year's commitment to working in the federal government. And to be a more competitive applicate, uh, applicant, you really need to want to spend more than a year, uh, or at least you need to view that year and tell them how you view that year is really integral to you doing what you want to do. Um, but it can't sort of be, well, I know that I have a year's worth of public service um, to give in exchange for this, and I guess I'm willing to do that. That will not be a competitive born um, application. The Critical Language Scholarship is a more limited one, but it's one that doesn't have that public service um, commitment requirement as part of it. So the Critical Language Scholarship only works with 15 languages that the uh, US Department of State deems as being critical for US national interest. And uh, they are defined on the website. Many of them, about half of them at least, do not require any previous training in that language. Uh, others require a year or two years of training in that language for you to be eligible for the program. Uh, but it does basically an eight to 10 week, very immersive, intense language training uh, in one in, in those 15 languages. So it's only, you know, it's, it's a summer program. It's at maximum a 10, 10 week program. And it does not require you to have any particular career path. It does not require you to go into federal service. Um, and so if you work with any one of those 15 critical languages, the CLS is a very good program for you to consider. If you're interested in research abroad, but you don't particularly need the language component of that, there's a number of different opportunities for that as well. The Chateaubriand Fellowship Program will provide doctoral students uh, anywhere from four to nine months of funding to do research in France. It has both a, um, a STEM side of it, but it also has a humanities and social sciences uh, specific program within the Chateaubriand Fellowship. And basically you do your self-directed research, but you do it in partnership with a French institution or affiliation. So you would need to make some sort of contact with a French institution, but then you're sort of doing your own work, um, just supported by them for the time that you're in France. The American Institute of Indian Studies Junior Fellowship is uh, open to graduate students to do up to 11 months of dissertation research in India. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are examples. Um, and there are often many more awards like this one. There is also an American Institute of fill in the blank. There's a, um, you know, it's not just American Institute of Indian Studies. There's a Bangladesh. There's um, a number throughout sort of North Africa, Middle East area. So if you need, if you, if your research would take you to some part of the world between basically North Africa, Middle East, and into uh, Asia, the American Institutes of blank country are probably a good thing for you to look into. The Fulbright US Student Program is one we work with uh, every year. We have an internal process for it at FSU. As long as you have not gotten your PhD or the terminal degree in your field, you are eligible for the Fulbright US Student Program. Uh, there are three different ways that you can engage in Fulbright. You can go teach English somewhere else in the world, uh, and that's their English teaching assistantship. You can do a self-directed research, either in an academic field or a creative arts field, and you can enroll in graduate studies. Um, so for instance, I'm working with a student in musicology right now, who's a PhD student in musicology, but who would like to go uh, earn an accelerated master's degree um, at the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, and get a MA in African Studies that he'll then come back and finish his PhD in musicology at FSU, but he would have this additional credential. So that's the sort of thing you can do through Fulbright. You can also just design your own research project and go do it in a Fulbright country. Fulbright can be, uh, depends on each country. There's 
Fulbright operates in something like 140 different countries, and each of those agreements is a binational one between the US and then the Fulbright Commission in that country. So the award types and um, structure of that particular experience differs from country to country. Some you can go for as short as six months, others you have to go from nine to 12 months. Uh, some allow you to even renew for another year beyond that if you've made substantial progress or have a good argument for why you need another year's worth of funding. So Fulbright has a lot of flexibility um, and is uh, something that we've had quite a few FSU students be successful in getting. The AAUW and PEO awards, um, both of them are specifically interested in funding women in graduate programs, but without any disciplinary restrictions. They both have award mechanisms for both US citizens and international students, as well as uh, more limited ones for returning students or continuing education. The Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans is one that if you um, if you are either the child of immigrants to the United States or you yourself are an immigrant to the United States but have since become either naturalized or a permanent resident uh, or have DACA status or refugee or asylee status, you would be able to apply for the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship. Again, there are no disciplinary restrictions for it. It funds two years of your graduate study and up to $90,000 over those two years, split between a stipend and tuition. Here's a couple of those residential fellowships I mentioned. Uh, so I have an example here of both a longer term one and a shorter term one. So the Carter G. Woodson Institute at University of Virginia is a, um, it's an institute uh, focused on African-American and African studies. They have a residential fellowship for pre-doctoral students. So before you've gotten uh, the PhD, they also have a postdoctoral program. So you would be in residence with uh, people, both early career and current graduate students at the Woodson. Provides $24,000 a year, um, access to the collections at the University of Virginia, and you just get immersed into this community of scholars who are all working on you know, related things. And um, the residential component of it is important that you are there in that scholarly community. The Huntington Library is a uh, huge library out in California with a bunch of different collections that span all sorts of different topics. Um, everything from like landscape architecture to uh, British Renaissance uh, to early America. Um, they have a lot of stuff. They, you can go for as short as a month to as long as five months as a graduate student to do um, research at the library. So if you need to work with its collections, they can, you can apply for the short-term fellowship, which would give you a, a stipend of $3,500 a month for the time that you are in residence. And again, there's both the, the idea that you have access to the library's collections, but also that you are there with a community of scholars who are working on all sorts of different things. And, um, you know, who's, who's especially at the Huntington, they're gonna be ranging from sort of all stages in their careers. I believe this is the last page of ones I pulled together. Um, and these are just sort of three kind of random ones, but I wanted to, uh, having seen some of the registrants, I wanted to make sure that we had the ones that might speak to some of the individual people who are here. So the Phillips Fund for Native American Research uh, provides $3,000 for linguistics, ethnohistory, and the history of studies of Native Americans, uh, but only in the continental United States or in Canada. So you cannot do research in Mexico or South America. Um, it does have a geographical restriction, but you can use it. You can use that funding for either a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation. So you do not have to be a PhD student to be able to get this uh, research funding. The Winter Grin Foundation provides a dissertation fieldwork grant for anthropology fieldwork. Um, I'm pretty sure I double checked this that all three of the ones on this page are also open to any student enrolled at a US institution. You do not have to be a US citizen. Um, and the Werner Grant, in fact, is open to um, people not even just at US institutions. I believe it's a uh, international uh, grant. But up to $25,000 for anthropology fieldwork, pretty open ended. Um, they say they have a, they particularly welcome proposals that integrate two or more subfields or pioneer new approaches. But other than that, um, and that's not a requirement, they just say they have a preference for that or they particularly welcome those applications. Uh, but they don't have any sort of particular focus on, you know, they don't really care what your topic is or the type of methodology you use or what it is exactly you're doing. 
uh, as long as you can make a strong argument for having a good project and needing the funding, uh, you'd be a, a good applicant. The Crest Foundation uh, History of Art Institutional Fellowship, again, this is a residential one. It would provide you funding to actually go uh, for two years to do research in one of six research centers in Europe. And those are in Florence, Leiden, London, Munich, Paris, and Rome. So we always want to really emphasize this point, uh, that external fellowships and awards have a fairly long timeline. And so it's really good for you to be thinking not just about the, the funding you need now or soon, but also what you might need in a year from now, two years from now, if you're in a doctoral program, even three or four years from now. Uh, maybe you're, you know, in your first year now, but you know, you'll be needing funding for dissertation research and dissertation write-up. So if you're aware of the things now that you might want to apply for, not only can you just get them on your list and be looking toward, forward to them, you can also think about the things you can do between now and when you apply to make yourself a stronger applicant for that particular award. Um, each award has slightly different things they're looking for. If you can see what those review criteria are, the things that that award emphasizes, you can perhaps seek out opportunities that would make you more competitive by the time you get to that application. But the more immediate thing I want you to realize is that external funding is rarely going to be a source of immediate funding. Typically, there's somewhere between eight to 12 months between when you um, submit the application and when the funds from that would disperse. And generally, the bigger and more competitive the award, the longer that timeline is. So some have rolling deadlines. Actually, the um, Institute for Humane Studies does not have a deadline. You can apply for that at any point. Uh, and some travel awards work similarly. They either have a rolling deadline or they have multiple deadlines, especially if they're sort of smaller travel awards. You can apply for them uh, multiple times a year or sort of like two months before you need to travel or they have some sort of, you know, built in lag like that. And so just to show you what that actually looks like, um, for the Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellowship, it has a deadline in early December. I believe it's December 15th. It might be December 8th. I get confused between the dissertation and the predoctoral. Uh, you would be notified that you've gotten the award in spring of 2023, usually around April. And the funds for that wouldn't start until your fall 2023 semester. So you have about eight months between when you submitted the application in December until you would start getting the funding from it in August. Fulbright can be even longer, again, depending on when uh, that particular country's grant period starts. You can have anywhere from 12 to 18 months between submitting that award and waiting for the funding to start. Um, so that's just to say, with external funding opportunities, you really need to be planning ahead. And working on the application itself takes significant time. Uh, and if you're going to work with us at the Office of Graduate Fellowships and Awards, we really like you to be setting up meetings with us about eight weeks before that application is due so that we have plenty of time to work through revising your application materials and getting everything um, really ready to submit. So I think instead of go through all of this, um, these sort of best tips, I'm gonna let that be something you all can read through on your own in the, when I send you this. And I think we'll sort of move toward the panel discussion since we are at four o'clock now and I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for that discussion. So uh, I will quickly introduce today's panelists and then I will stop my screen share. We are joined today by Dr. Elizabeth Cecil, Assistant Professor of Religion. Dr. Vincent Jus, Assistant Professor in the Department of um, Modern Languages, although I believe actually trained in anthropology. And we are joined also by Aaron Rodriguez, a PhD candidate in the Department of English. So we are thrilled to have the three of you with us today. Okay, so, uh, Across the three of you on this panel, we have quite different um, humanities and social sciences fields and approaches represented uh, from religion to anthropology to um, English, but uh, I believe, Aaron, your work in English is not uh, what everybody might think of when they think of somebody in an English department. So I'd like to begin by the, each of you just sort of introducing the work you do, and if you could tell us a little bit about some of the funding that you've applied for or secured in the process of um, well, in the process of doing your work. Um, Dr. Cecil, we can start with you since I introduced you first. 
Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm a historian of religion. I work on um, religious sites in South and Southeast Asia um, in the kind of early medieval period. I do a lot of archival research, archaeological, art historical field work, and then I work uh, with textual sources as well. So in terms of um, funding that I've gotten before, um, I had some funding for my dissertation research from the ACLS, the SSRC, and um, the CLIR Mellon Fellowship, which I didn't see on the list, but it's specifically for archival research or research in original sources. So if you do any work with archives, uh, it would be a good one to consider as well. And then as a, as a um, kind of professional, I've had funding from the NEH, uh, from Mellon, from the Getty, and from the ACLS. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Hughes, would you like to tell us about your work? Oh, if we want. Um, so I work in the modern languages department, but I'm a cultural anthropologist. I do field work in Haiti on um, post-disaster reconstruction. So many on issues of uh, housing, urban planning and infrastructures. Um, I got, uh, my, my field work was funded by, uh, by the NSF along with a string of really small grants from my university. I was at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So it's really important also to look at uh, smaller parts of money uh, when you do a project, especially at the end of the field work, if you want to prolong, you, you stay over there. Um, in terms of grants, I can talk a lot about, about the ones that I didn't get, I applied to, uh, to the NEH and I will apply uh, to it again. Um, I, I received a pre-doctoral uh, Woodson Fellowship that you were talking about at UVA, but I had to decline it because I got a postdoctoral uh, job at Duke. So um, that, that's those are the big grants that I that I got. Yes. Great, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned uh, smaller pots of money. That is something that we often tell people. You know, it's really important. Um, to not disregard those small awards. I know it can seem like a lot of work to get an application in for something that maybe doesn't seem like it has a huge payoff, uh, but the experience you get of applying is always good, right? You, you might reuse those materials in some way for later awards, but also the more small things you win, the more competitive you are for the big ones. Uh, yes. As I'm sure the three of you can, can attest to, um, funders like to fund people who have already been funded. Uh, it's just, Maybe an unfortunate truth of the way this works that um, having a, a track right, so it makes it harder to win that first one. But after you get that first one, you're more competitive for all the next ones you apply to. Uh, so those smaller awards can be really critical in getting you to be competitive for those big awards. So Aaron, uh, please tell us about your work and, and some of the things that uh, some of the grants you've been a part of. Yeah, so uh, I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in the English department, and my research is a little, I guess, different than what people expect. I, I work with comics and I work with creating um, access to comics for blind and low vision readers. Um, I have, I, so I started the grant writing process back in 2017 uh, for this project. So it's been, a, 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 I guess, a long road, um, but it started with a, a $2,000 uh, grant uh, and then yearly after that that started growing and, and in 2020 um, the project was awarded a NEH and then a Alfred P. Sloan Foundation grant. Very recognizable names. Okay so um, I'll ask this question slightly differently. Uh, to Dr. Hughes and, and Dr. Cecil than I will for you, Aaron, but I'm interested in knowing a little bit about the relationship between applying for graduate funding and then applying for funding as a faculty member. Uh, so the ways that maybe uh, for Dr. Cecil and Hughes, the ways that you see your experience applying for funding and, and securing some funding as a graduate student, um, both making you competitive on the job market, the role it might've played in your competitiveness on the job market, but also how that has helped you as a, a faculty member um, know how to apply for funding. You know, what, what is it you actually learned about the process in grad school that has helped your professional development, helped you get where you are now? 
Uh, Dr. Hughes, we can start with, with you this time. Okay. Um, so I, I guess it would be related to, to, to your field. Uh, of course, that, that will decide what, what kind of grant you will apply to. Uh, in cultural anthropology, since you have to do long-term field work, you don't have a choice but to get funding. Otherwise, you cannot advance in your uh, in your PhD. So I, I was kind of forced to get one of of the big grants. Um, I applied for SSRC, when a grant, and NSF. Um, what really helped me when I when I was a graduate student, two two things really helped me. Uh, first, it was to take uh, a full semester grant writing class where we were uh, writing a full grant. So I know that sometimes for social sciences, it's happening in geography or in religion with Dr. Helwig, who uh, teaches a full semester. And it's, it's, it's really great because that's where you are uh, creating also a community um, of um, grant writers of writers with whom you will exchange peer reviews uh, along the way. So the second thing that I wanted to, to uh, state, um, perhaps the, the most important thing when, when I was applying for those grants was the, the feedback that I would get and where I would get the feedback and being stra strategic about it. How do you plan the feedback with who you are going to work? And it takes quite a lot of time. So that's something really to think about. Uh, but it's really valuable. The, the people I worked with 10 years ago to get the grants uh, are still people I'm collaborating with when we are writing grants or articles or we, we, we talk about the, the, the writing process. So um, I, I'm not sure if it's answering the question, but as a graduate student uh, writing grants, uh, it's of course a kind of a solitary activity, but in a way, created a community of scholars for me uh, that is still important to this day. Um, plus, you, you, you learn a lot about writing. Uh, I, I find it very useful, especially for the job market, uh, when you will have someone to sell you, your research and to tell people why it's important to, to, tell, your, to tell about your contributions. Um, now, applying to grants when you are sort of the, on the other side of the fence, uh, when you are faculty, um, well, it's very different. The, the, the parts of money that are available are very different as well. That will depend on the project that you are working on. Um, and likewise, I still rely on that, on that community of, of grant writers when I was in grad school. Um, yeah, not sure I'm answering the question, but no, that's that's great. I, I want to ask one uh, clarifying question about that community of uh, the writing community, scholarly community that you built in graduate school that you still rely on. Um, are they all were they all people from your your field, your discipline, or is it a more is it a broader group? Actually, it was a broader group. Um, we were mostly applying for cultural anthropology, but they were people from Roman studies. And actually, someone who, who got a Wenogram, uh, who was in a modern language, modern languages department at Duke, in the Roman studies department at Duke. So uh, you, you were talking about the crossovers. Sometimes uh, the NSF or the Wenogram or even SSRC uh, will give a, one of those big grants to people in the humanities, especially when it requires doing archival work or ethnography or going to museums and when you need to travel and to do some kind of field work. Um, so it has a lot to do with your methodologies and where you need to go, your, your, your plan of study. Um, but I mean, we have someone from Roman studies and someone from geography as well. Uh, so geography, you do field work and uh, cultural geography is very similar in a way to, to cultural anthropology. Uh, honoring you have your hand up, do you have a question? Yes, I have a follow up question about the class um, that you mentioned, um, because I know Aaron took that class at FSU and I would love to have his perspective on on the class um, that um, Dr. Juice mentioned. Yeah, so I didn't I, I took it through LIS, so it was, um, I, I think the I think in the whatever master's degree 
for librarians. I think that was a, an optional class that they could take. Um, so all I know is it was a great experience. I'm not still connected with those, um, the groups that we were assigned mostly because we were, I guess I was in English and they were in um, other fields. Um, but I, I found it uh, incredibly informative. I didn't get an NEH before that class. I took that class and then I got the NEH. So um, it, it really helped uh, learn how all the, the small parts of these complicated grants fit together and, and also understand what the expectations are because um, I think it's overwhelming and, and sometimes it feels like you're repeating yourself a lot um, in your grant writing, but there's very specific things you need to put in each section. And, and so I, I think that helped me understand the genre of grant writing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dr. Cecil, I'll, I'll go to you with this question. Um, you mentioned a few things that you had gotten to fund your dissertation work. So uh, same question to you of sort of the, the both sides of that question. How did that help make you more competitive for um, going on the job market, make you stand out among applicants? Um, but also how did that help you get to the point where now you, you continue to win things as a faculty member? Sure. So I think unlike uh, Dr. Juice, um, I was in a religion department. It wasn't really common for graduate students to do field work um, or to really apply for many uh, external grants, but I knew that was something that I wanted to do, and it was important for me to spend um, a long time in, in India and Nepal for my research. So I was kind of really forced out of my comfort zone, and you know, one of the ways that I, I started to think about how I could uh, translate the work that I was doing for a broader audience, like the audience of uh, people who are reading grant applications, was by visiting um, like some of the graduate student colloquia and other departments at my university at the time. So like I would present my research in progress in the classics department or in archaeology. I got invited to the anthro department once. Um, and so that really gave me the opportunity to think about how can I describe what I'm doing in a way that communicates the importance, the relevance, and the timeliness of that to people who are outside of the field of, um, you know, early um, South Asian studies or the study of Hinduism, for example. And I think that was really helpful. And that also gave me the confidence to apply for grants that weren't necessarily like in my field. Um, so I applied for an SSRC, which is for uh, social science researchers, and I got that to do field work. Um, I applied for this Clear Mellon uh, fellowship, which was for archival research. So I had to kind of make the argument that, oh, you know, visiting archeological sites is like a material archive. So I am doing archival research, even though it may not look like what a typical archival research looks like. So things like that. And I think um, that's a really important process, uh, an important part of being successful in, in grant writing is being able to communicate that and being able to communicate kind of the methodological innovativeness of your project, even if it's not necessarily radically innovative, but if you can kind of put a spin on it or kind of make it seem um, as if uh, you're kind of doing something a little bit experimental or a little, little bit innovative. Um, but I think getting those grants, of course, it allowed me to, to spend, I was in South Asia for two and a half years um, in my PhD program. So that made me really competitive on the job market because I had been able to spend so much time doing my work. My work was really advanced as a result. Um, so I think that gives you an advantage, just the work that I was able to do. Um, and also, of course, when people see that your work has been recognized by people outside of your immediate area, people who didn't necessarily work with you as dissertation advisors, um, that really shows that that you are able to communicate the relevance of your research to a broader audience and that other people are receptive to that. So I think that is important when you're on the job market or looking for a postdoc or, or even for a career outside of academia uh, per se. I think those things are valuable. And as far as, um, yeah, applying for things as a faculty member, it's, uh, you know, some things remain the same. Um, communicating the relevance of your work to people outside of your field, that's always a challenge. I think it's always something that you're kind of constantly thinking about negotiating the specific people in your field, your specific audience, and then everyone else that you want to kind of um, engage in, in conversation or people that you want to engage with your work. So those things don't change. Um, there's still a lot of applying, um, a lot of uh, failure, right? For every success, I think there's also a lot of things that you don't get 
that also doesn't change. Um, so yeah, I think there are perhaps more opportunities as a faculty member, um, but I think the process and the challenges um, that are involved in that process of winning grants, um, there's a lot of continuity between the graduate experience and the, the faculty experience also. Yeah. Uh, you, you brought up a number of things that I want to come back and discuss when we get into talking about methodology and significance. Um, because you're right, those are the things people struggle with the most, and those are the hardest things to do. Um, but I think seeking out opportunities to do that as a graduate student um, is a great idea and something that maybe people don't always keep in mind that that itself is, is training you for something else that you're going to do as well. Uh, so Aaron, you, um, You've, you've won a number of things that graduate students don't typically apply for or win. Uh, NEH and Alfred P. Sloan, those are things that I think we associate more with faculty members winning um, from those. So I'm wondering what what the, the process of applying for those, how that has given you maybe a unique insight on applying for funding as a graduate student and how that makes you feel about um, now applying maybe for some of the more sort of typical graduate uh, fellowships and awards. Yeah, so I guess, uh... Technically, um, although it's my project, as a graduate student, you can't win an NEH. And so um, I was lucky enough to have, um, during my master's degree, uh, a professor right across the hall, we started this kind of research group. Uh, and so I applied for the NEH uh, and he was the principal investigator on that. And then I was just a researcher. Um, but one thing we made clear during that process was that was only our title on the application. Um, and then for that Alfred P. Sloan, they didn't have the same rules that um, the NEH had. And so I was able to be a, a co-PI on that grant. Um, and so I think, yeah, you know, there isn't a lot of funding and funding is competitive for those uh, ACLS Mellon uh, dissertation fellowships. And so I think uh, I would encourage everybody to be creative, um, but also protect their own intellectual property, because that's one thing that I had to give up in exchange for applying some of these grants, mm. um, a, a Faustian bargain, if you will, that I, I no longer control the IP for the research that I'm doing. Um, and you know, maybe that's a, a discussion for another day, but I do think um, she's getting up on my graduate student soapbox. I feel like, you know, we're overworked and underpaid. And then, uh, if, if we don't get to, you know, keep the fruits of our labors, then I, I you know, I think that's an, that's an even bigger issue. Uh, so I, I guess in, to sum it all up, I would say, I think we need to be creative, um, to find, uh, to find funds to support research, uh, especially in the humanities when, um, you know, if you're an English PhD student studying romantic poetry, there's not a lot of grants you can go apply for that will um, give you a lot of money to continue doing that. So it's important to find the why and, and the importance to the humanities uh, for these grants. Well, that's a, that's a great segue into a discussion of um, communicating that why, the, the importance of the work you do, the um, the significance and, and you know communicating that to the broad audience. Uh, Dr. Cecil, as you mentioned, there's often the sort of two-step of you're communicating both to experts in your field, and so you need to come off as an expert to them as well, but you also need to communicate to people outside of your field, sometimes from very different fields, um, who aren't going to know that specialized language of your discipline, who know instead sort of the broader questions that other disciplines are asking that relate to yours, uh, but they don't necessarily know even how it is done in your discipline. I did a uh, I did a year long Mellon seminar on climate change as a graduate student, and we spent the first two weeks just talking to each other about our disciplines because we all did things really differently, and so we just needed to sort of understand how each other, what methodology looks like in our fields, what evidence looks like in our work, how we work with theory or don't as much, um, or do work with theory, but don't call it theory, uh, which is what we do as historians. Um, so it's it's hard, and it's something that we're we're sort of constantly trying to do. Uh, so let me think about the best way to ask this. 
when, so we'll start with methodology. Um, when you're writing about your methodology in a grant application or a fellowship application, what is the main thing it is you want your reviewers to come away with understanding? What are you really trying to communicate when you lay out your methodology? I think I think it depends in part on the on the kinds of sources or materials that you use for your research. So I'll just use myself as a specific example. So on the one hand, when I talk about my methodology in a grant application, I need to communicate to the funders that I am a person with the kind of expertise necessary to work with the sources that I work with. So for many people, that includes training in languages. So wow. I definitely want to make sure that people know when they read my application that I have the necessary training and experience working in primary source languages to do research. Um, field work, uh, field work experience is another kind of important element of that, right? So if you're an anthropologist or, or maybe a certain kind of cultural historian, um, you're gonna wanna make clear to, to funders that you have experience working in particular countries with particular kinds of sources and materials, and that you also have a network of people who can help you do the work that you need to do if you get funding to go work overseas, that you're not just kind of showing up there with no preparation, no colleagues, no kind of collaborative network that's gonna support the innovative work that you want to do. Then on the other hand, you need to kind of um, balance that kind of specific skills-based methodology with asking some some broader questions that help your work to resonate with social issues or kind of broader methodological concerns that are happening within um, say the humanities or the social sciences more broadly. So that's kind of up to you then to decide what are the issues that you can kind of um, talk about as being relevant to your project. Like, so for me, it would be things like new materialism or spatial humanities, uh, digital humanities, right? So that kind of positions my project in a much broader set of um, conversations about, about digital humanities, about how we talk about materiality and objects. Um, so I'm kind of balancing specific skills-based methods with broader theoretical questions and concerns when I think about how to write my proposals. Great. Um, I have a follow-up question first. Um, oh, okay. I'll just ask the follow-up question. So you said, sometimes you say, you say new materialism or spatial humanities. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Hughes and Aaron, you guys can address this as well, but do you find it useful in applications to think in terms of sort of expecting your readers to understand methodological shorthand, mm -hmm. things like saying new materialism, or do you think that that's something that you should actually write out and explain? I definitely write out and explain it. Um, so I would say something like, oh, by doing X, Y, and Z, or asking these questions about how people relate to materials at this site, what I'm doing is actually relating my specific work to a broader set of concerns around material agency, um, in parentheses, new materialisms, things like that. So I definitely would um, make an effort to, uh, to explain um, if I'm going to use terms like that, um, I wouldn't just kind of uh, like, I wouldn't just randomly drop it in in the proposal and expect that people will um, be uh, receptive to that. Sure, yeah. Um, and or Dr. Hughes, do you have sort of, what, what is it you all are trying to communicate when you communicate methodology? What do you want people to understand from your methodological discussion? <clears throat> Yes, I, I fully agree with what Dr. Cecil uh, just said. Also, how do you calibrate your research questions with your your your, uh, your methodologies? Um, one of the tricks that I used in my NSF was to repeat my research questions that I had in the in the in the narrative in the methodology and answering each of these questions with how I am going to do that. So the, the, the word methodology, it's, it's not a fun section to write, I must say, uh, but you can demystify it in, in a way. Methodology is, is plainly how are you going to do this? How are you qualified? Where are you going to go? Uh, and what kinds of activities you will do there? Usually uh, in the NSF, it's, uh, um, you follow up with a schedule of activities. Um, and again, it's really, so perhaps it's easier in ethnography. I had the chance also to, um, um, it was another residential fellowship to, to take a, a methods class during a, a full summer 
at UF with, uh, with NSF as well. So we have kind of a big toolbox of methodologies that are available out there. But you cannot take the big book of methodologies in, in ethnography and just pick out things like this. It really needs to match your research questions. Uh, and getting a lot of feedback on this is really important as well, because again, I think it's it's a it's a tricky part of, of the proposal to write. Um, but when you talk about it, you, you see what works, what doesn't work. And again, it's uh, to me, it's the most visual part of the research. It's really telling people what you are going to do and where you are going to go. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm doing a new project. I'm writing an NEH. I mean, I wrote an NEH for that project that failed. So I'm rewriting the, the NEH. Uh, it's, uh, it's a project in history. And I think that where I failed in my last proposal, so when you, you, you write grants, you get good feedback, especially with uh, NEH, which is really useful even if you don't get the grant. Um, I need to be a lot more precise to, to describe the archives where I, I'm going to go and what kind of questions will I answer with what kinds of archives. Uh, so it, it's about being very precise, but in the meantime, it's a fine balance. You are also talking about academics who may not be in your research and sometimes it's very niche. Um, so when it's very niche, uh, like Dr. Cecil was talking about materialism, yes, you need to explain to a lay audience what it would mean. And likewise, with some of the methods that you are going to use. Um, but again, the, the, the way I structure it and that's the way I work with them, it's really how, I, I mean, I'm taking my, usually I have three research questions and that makes three sections of my methodology section as well. Uh, I find it easier to, to, to do it that way. Yeah, it's great. I think I think a thing I've noticed working with some graduate students at times is um, I think people forget that like the collection you're going to go work with and telling that to the reviewers is part of explaining your methodology that you have identified the proper sources. Well, maybe you have. You think you've identified the proper sources to answer the research questions you have, and showing the alignment between those is part of that methodological discussion. What about you, Aaron? On the the ones that you've worked with? Um, um, yeah, I was going to say the. The only thing I have to say from a graduate student perspective is that I think I had a lot of insecurity writing these uh, methodology sections at first, um, but um, I've come to realize that there's a lot of uh, predicting the future that's required of you. Um, and so don't be afraid to really, you know, claim what you what you're going to accomplish in these sections and know that if that's not what you end up accomplishing, that's not the end of the world. Um, the integrity of your research matters more than whether or not you follow this um, plan that you established, you know, sometimes 18 months before your, your grant has ended. Yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you for saying that. I think that's another thing that um, can seem confusing to students sometimes. And, and you see that confusion come across in a whole lot of qualified language in the application of, you know, if this works out, then I would do this, and then I would do this. And if neither of those worked out, maybe I would do these three or four other things. And, you know, the, the, it's, it's a proposal. Everybody understands it's in the future and it might change. And then the, the process of the research itself might well change the way the research goes. So um, the trick is to lay out what you think is sort of the best case or ideal scenario, the way you would like it to go, the things you think are the most likely things you'll be doing. And in part, what you're showing them in the application is also that you can design a project, that you can imagine what it would look like to do this research in a year. Part of methodology for a lot of people is theory, um, which I think can be even more confusing to incorporate into a application. Um, trying to figure out what level of theory, sort of, you know, what level of detail you can discuss it in based on who you, your review audience is expected to be. Um, and I think. Also, sometimes people are confused by theory and, and confused in the way they explain it. So if you have incorporated sort of theoretical aspects, um, a theoretical basis into your work, how have you communicated that in the applications you've, you've put together? I, I recognize that may not be applicable, but if it is, uh, you have any advice on that? I think the only advice I have on it is, is um, 
so my research deals a lot with uh, translation studies and that can be complicated because then that gets really uh, kind of blends with uh, how different readers interpret different things. And for someone who's not, um, hasn't spent a lot of time dealing with that, those are sometimes new uh, ideas that they're encountering. And so I like to go to introduction to X textbook and reread how they're explaining these uh, dense theoretical sections and then try and incorporate some of those uh, pared down simplified ideas, knowing that I'm not writing this for my professor who's reviewing this, who's an expert in this area. I'm writing it for you know someone who might be encountering these ideas for the first time. And how can you uh, get that light bulb to click in one paragraph or one sentence? Yeah, that's going back and reading those overviews is a great idea for uh, how to do that. Dr. Jews or Dr. Cecil, do you have anything to add? Dr. Cecil? I think the, the theory section for me is always a little bit more confusing even than the, the methodology, methodology section. And the way I've kind of thought about it and that I've kind of discussed it with my colleagues is that, you know, when you position yourself within a kind of set of theories, you're trying to show the people that are reading your grant proposal that you're part of a conversation. And that you know who the main people engaged in that conversation are and that you have something to contribute to it. So there are ways that you can kind of signal that in, in your writing, right? Whether it's using kind of footnotes that direct people to uh, a relevant kind of cross section of important publications or writings in that area. Um, the bibliography, uh, people do actually look carefully at the bibliographies that you submit with grant proposals. That's one way to show, okay, I am aware of a range of different kind of intersecting issues within my field. And I'm kind of showing you that by the sources that I'm strategically putting on this bibliography. So I think as, um, as Aaron really kind of nicely explained that it's not about kind of explaining um, all the kind of theoretical nuances within a particular field, rather it's kind of showing your ability to summarize a conversation and position yourself within it. Yeah, I think that, so maybe that makes it, um, putting it that way, I think maybe makes it seem a little less exotic to think of it because it just becomes part of, part of the lit review and part of the, the, the you know previous literature on this topic, the putting yourself into uh, that broader conversation, which every application should be doing in some way, at least. Uh, just quickly, uh, I'm thinking about the winner grain in particular. They, they are always asking to have two or three subfields, um, not, not just one um, line of you know, methodology or, or theory. Uh, and likewise, with the new ACLS, they are asking for innovation. I think that the, the lit review part or the theory part is a uh, it's a good way to do it because you can put in dialogue sometimes sub-disciplines that are not into dialogue. Um, so that, that's the way I see it because we make our own ideas or our own theoretical framework by putting scholarly ideas into dialogue. I think it's important to, to do that. It shows in the bibliography, but that's, I think, one of the aspects where you can take an edge on, on, the, on the proposal is to show not really sophistication of being able to explain those, those grant theories. That's the work of the dissertation or of the book, maybe. Uh, in the grant, you need to show that, yes, you are part of the conversation and that you can put ideas from really varied fields sometimes into, uh, into dialogue to create your own. Um, so it's kind of tricky to do, but in a way, it's, um, it's more a matter of juggling than, uh, than going very deep into uh, into the theory. I don't think that the grant is, I mean, it's useful to, to think you read a lot, but uh, it's not what you are doing the, 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 the deep theory work, I guess. No, certainly, I think, I think you're right. That, uh, I mean, especially most, you know, I think about the longest any fellowship application, at least this cycle that I'm working with the student on gives them seven double space pages to lay out their project. Uh, which goes by quickly if you start to have whole paragraphs devoted to literature review and, and theoretical basis for your work. Uh, seven pages is not is not particularly long. Uh, so that's a great discussion of methodology. Um, you know, I, 
I ask that question. I think it's important to discuss because something I, I hear a lot when I work with students is, um, especially in the humanities, of I don't know how to write about theory or, or sorry about methodology other than to say, well, I read stuff and then I write about it. Um, so I think giving people an idea of how they can go beyond that and and really what it is that section should try to communicate, and then they can work backward from that understanding is, um, I think, beneficial. So let's move from some methodology to significance and selling your readers on the broader significance of your work or the um, sort of the stakes of the work, the so what question behind the work. Uh, and I think this is a, another place where, um, you know, Aaron, you said something about working on romantic poetry. I think students who are doing things like that can really feel like, well, I don't know why this matters. Um, I'm interested in it. I think it matters. But, you know, they look at students applying for something like the Ford who are in, you know, a STEM field where they're doing uh, applied research for, you know, something that's a life-saving device. And it's harder to see why the work you're doing maybe matters in relationship to the competition you think you're up against for that award. Um, but it undoubtedly does. We wouldn't all be here in this conversation about humanities and social sciences if we didn't know that they matter. So how do you convince people of that? Um, Dr. Cecil, I think I'll start with you because I know that you got the uh, ACLS Mellon Dissertation Completion Fellowship, and I know it asked you for a paragraph about the broader significance of your work for the humanities. So how do you go about setting that up? How do you, especially as a graduate student, pull yourself out of the weeds and the sort of the specific, uh, specificity of your own work to remember what those broader issues even are in your field? Yeah, so that was, I'm trying to remember what I wrote. That was for my first, ended up being my first book. Um, so one of the things that I was arguing was that I'm studying a religious community in ancient India, but um, studying this community, community raises a set of broader kinds of concerns and issues about how we can study communities, not only in the present, but in the past, and how we can read sources differently and look at sources differently to access marginalized voices. So that was like my whole argument is that my project accesses marginalized voices, the voices of women, the voices of kind of subaltern non elite actors and brings those those people and their concerns and the things that they were doing to the forefront of our kind of historical perspective or historical knowledge. So that was like more of a, I guess you could say a kind of methodological intervention that I was making um, and people were receptive to that. In the grants that I've been working on now, I make a kind of similar argument and I, I try to show how um, we can look at indigenous religious ecologies and the ways that indigenous communities um, in Southeast Asia interact with their environments and value their environments. And we can learn a lot from that um, for thinking about kind of contemporary human nature uh, and ecological inter interaction. So I try to position the historical work that I'm doing that's very specific, that's often uh, rooted in the study of the past and try to connect that with issues that are important now um, and which are relevant to my project. So in this case, it's kind of a broader set of ecological concerns and questions about um, indigeneity in relation to um, ecology. Yeah, that's great. So uh, the, I don't necessarily, and so going back to the methodology discussion, I'm not sure it occurs to a lot of people to think that their methodology might be part of the significance, especially when you're a graduate student. So I think that's, that's uh, thank you for pointing that out, that the way that you are recovering voices, the way you're working with the sources could be part of what your broader contribution is. Um, yeah, and I think if you would ask most historians, they would they would say, well, yeah, obviously that's that's what we do, right? And it maybe it is kind of obvious and maybe it isn't something that you necessarily think is significant, but it's all about how you kind of rhetorically present that in a grant proposal because these are kind of rhetorical documents. So it's, it's, there's a lot in, in the presentation, I think, as well. Yeah, well, and I think it's also the sort of thing that sometimes you can be working on it and you can think, well, this isn't really that exciting or this isn't really that innovative, um, but you've just been working on it long enough that you've kind of forgotten maybe that it is. Um, so it can be good to have those moments that pull you back to that. Uh, we will, I'm going to go on with, with Dr. Jews and Aaron for the same question in a moment, but I want to say to everybody, I'm going to launch a poll um, just to make sure I get it launched uh, before. So it's just feedback for our workshops. If you would just please take a moment, um, those of you who are in the audience to answer our workshop survey, I'll just leave it open until we end the workshop. 
So Dr. Chu, how do you go about framing the broader significance of your work, um, especially when you're trying to speak to both the expert audience and the non-expert audience in the applications? Yes, so perhaps the way I see it is when I, I talk about the broader significance, I'm not talking to experts anymore, but really to a, a general public. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to imagine. Uh, the, the broader significance is the so what question, why does it matter? Uh, and, um, and especially yeah, for, for, for present questions. So in the NSF, for instance, also in the Winogrand, um, you have a section where you uh, you can tell about your contributions to to your field and to your discipline. The broader significance is something something different, I think. Um, so one of the tips that's the way I proceed. I I um, I see the broader significance sort of like the icing in the uh, icing on the cake. So the cake needs to be baked to be refrigerated also for, for, for a little while, meaning that I like to have one or two weeks at least of a distance, not thinking about my grant and going back with a fresh eye and taking a step back and asking myself, why is it of importance? Uh, what does it contribute to? Um, so if I take the example of my, of my own project, I was looking at vernacular architecture uh, in Haiti. Um, the, the contribution to my field for, for architecture history or art history is that not many people have been writing about it, so there is a gap and I'm, I'm sort of filling the gap. But the, the, the broader significance of that is that we already have a blueprint in Haiti for building houses that are disaster resistant. Uh, and these, these are vernacular structures that have existed on the island for the past 200 years. So, and again, you, you, you make, likewise, I made a, a methodology point, uh, the, the, the fact that I will draw these buildings, that I will study these buildings really in, um, in detail, that will kind of uh, give us clues of how to build um, disaster resistant structures, I guess. That, that was kind of, kind of the argument that I was making. Uh, in the meantime, in my work, I'm doing. Uh, I'm looking at what international organizations are doing in terms of housing, and how it's completely disconnected from Haitian cultural and social needs. So again, trying to 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 put forth uh, something that that already exists in uh, in the island. So to me, that's the broader significance of my first book, I guess. Um, but again, it's the the ability of um, it's a tricky section to write, but that's why you need time when you are writing a grant. That's not something that you can do in three weeks. Uh, at some point, you will be kind of tired of, it can be repetitive and uh, it's good to have, you know, to push it back for a little while and, and to go back to it, especially when you write that small section, the broader significance, but I think it has a big impact on reviewers. And Aaron, what about uh, you? And, and how do you, so you know, specifically being a graduate student, um, maybe this wasn't true for you. I, I know that it is for some students that you know, a big part of your, your training as a graduate student is training you to learn uh, the language, the frameworks, the perspectives of your discipline and to be a sort of insider. And you get so much focus on that that you can, you don't get a whole lot of times that you're encouraged to lift your head up and remember, Oh, that you know the people down the hall in the other department are asking the same question, but in different ways. Um, and so we all share these sort of these big questions we're asking in the humanities and social sciences. Um, that you know, if you could remember those and link your work to them, provide convenient ways to frame around some of the broader significance. Um, but so little graduate training is aimed at reminding you of those connections between your field and others. So, uh, can you give us the graduate student perspective on how you've gone about? both remembering and then uh, framing the broader significance of the work you do. Yeah, so I think it's uh, because of that inundation um, and you know the time you spend in a very specific area, you can kind of forget that you take that knowledge for granted. And so when you're writing, you know, why your research is important, it's, uh, you need to remember to include that. Um, and not take it for granted. And, and one of the mistakes I made 
uh, the first time applying for uh, the NEH and Alfred Peace Loan was that um, I didn't, I just kind of assumed that, so with creating access to multimodal materials, I assumed, okay, this is an idea everybody can get behind. Um, but what it felt like with the feedback I received was that, well, why someone from the English department? You know, what skills did you have that make you the, the, the person to do this? Um, and why are you reaching into these other disciplines to take, you know, tools from their toolbox? Um, so not sure if I have a really, you know, succinct way of ending this, um, but it's, I guess it's still something that I'm thinking about and, you know, gives me anxiety every time I have to write a grant. But I think sometimes that anxiety is good. So, um, yeah, I'll stop talking now. Well, I didn't mean to force, force a return to the anxiety for you, but, um, but you brought up something that, that has, that has been mentioned a couple of times before, and I think is worth reiterating that every application is doing two things, right? It's, it's laying out a project that's a good project. It's also pitching yourself as the researcher for that project. And so it's not enough to just design a very good project because you might convince the reviewers that, yeah, this is a great project and it should, it should exist in the world. We'd be happy to fund it. Um, but if they don't think that you're the right person for that project, they're not going to fund you to do it. Uh, and so you have to do both of those things in the application. Um, so for you, Aaron, that was explaining why somebody in English is, you know, what it is particular to you that makes you, that makes you the person to do that project. Um, even when it might seem like you're not in the, the discipline they would have expected somebody to be pitching that project from. So we are close to the end here. So I want to end on, um, end on a question for the three of you also that I think is really important to understand or, or to get perspectives on, which is, um, you know, we all apply for things we don't get. And it can be easy to think of that as wasted effort, uh, as wasted time, uh, to be just disappointed in the project. Um, or uh, you know, in, in the application, but we still get something from the uh, experience of having to apply. There's a, a great Gamble Rogers quote I like a lot that is, uh, "Experience is what we get when we don't get what we wanted." Um, so, if you could talk a little bit about what you've learned through some of the applications that you've applied for and not gotten, what you've still gotten out of the experience of having applied for things that ultimately you weren't successful in securing that particular funding. Dr. Shoes, we can start with you because you. You part of your introduction was to say you uh, there's a lot of things you applied for and didn't get. So, <laughs> um, I, I mean it's a little bit it's the game. Some some of the funding we are applying to are only taking five percent sometimes or ten percent. So, um, but but it's also the rule of the game in academia. You need to be comfortable with reject with a rejection uh, at times, uh, even often. So it's, uh, it's, it's unpleasant, but you, you get over it if you don't get the money. I think that you get a lot from writing a grant anyways, uh, that is useful, especially when you are graduate students. The, the most useful thing for me was to be able to put my argument in a nutshell, to be able to explain the significance of my research in less than five hours to someone, because when you are going to go on interviews and to have conversations, with a dean, with its, you know, if you if you plan to go in academia at least, uh, I found it um, to be a very good preparation actually for, for for the job market, and what will follow up. If you think about the cover letter that you are going to write for a job, academic job or, or not, likewise you will need to to make a, a sound argument, and to kind of sell your skills and your research and and your backstory. So I, I find it very useful for that. Uh, I said also at the beginning that it was very useful for me to uh, to form a, a community of scholars with whom I, I, I still work with. Um, and again, if you go into academia, it, it would be very important to have a, a community of, writer, of writers, a community of colleagues uh, with whom you can be in dialogue, with whom you can exchange uh, feedback. Uh, you create relations on, on the long term, I believe. Um, on a more uh, pragmatic, uh, um, a more pragmatic thing, the, the grants that are right, part of it I recycle. Um, the, the, the NSF that I wrote became more or less the, the prospectus for my dissertation. 
uh, I mean, I extended the, the lit review and things like this, but I, I really tweaked it. Once you write also one proposal, let's say the NSF, it's just a matter of tweaking uh, to apply for the SSRC, to apply for the Winogren. Those are different format, but you can uh, play with copy and paste and not just copy and pasting. I mean, it takes time, but uh, you, you already have a basis for, for, for what you want to do. So uh, a grant in itself, I know that it will be disappointing when you're not getting it, but you can think about a document that you can also recycle, uh, that can be useful, parts of it that you will use in, again, cover letters. Um, I should not say this, but in one article that I will publish, there is a, a bit of a grant that I copy and pasted because it worked. Um, and sometimes you don't have to, to reinvent the wheel. So it's hard work to write a grant. It's really, you know, it, it demands a lot of focus, but uh, it, in the end, I think it really pays off, even if you don't get it. Um, that's my take on it. I mean, just to follow up with that, I, I completely agree. I'm a huge fan of recycling, and I think there's no shame in that. I actually think that's that's what we we should be doing. So I have the opening line of, of uh, my ACLS Mellon dissertation uh, completion fellowship is the first line of my book. Right. I use the same intro because it worked so well. Right. And you spend so much time investing in like the perfect line or the perfect turn of phrase or the kind of perfect way of expressing um, to an audience what you're trying to do. And it completely makes sense that that we keep using those things in articles or I see some of it now in um, the narrative that I had to write um, because I'm going up for tenure. Some of the same things um, from a recent grant application were in there. So um, not only is it like good practice for getting rejected, which yeah, we can always, I guess, get more practice at that, um, but also uh, gives us material to reuse and kind of support our ongoing scholarly agendas or job getting agendas or postdoc getting agendas or, or whatever it may be. Um, I, I was gonna say one of the most beneficial things that came from failing is that you can ask for feedback on your grant and so, um, the, the first time I didn't get an NEH, uh, I read through the comments and I, you know, understand it, a huge component of the grant that I, I, I didn't include in there. Uh, the second time I didn't get it, um, one of the reviewers said, you know, I question the, the, uh, the, why this matters for humanities research. Uh, and so every time you get that feedback and some of it you don't have to take like uh, you're smart enough you you can know what you need to put in there um because not all reviewers are good people um i think i don't know um but anyway so i think that's that's a great thing that you can learn from um uh, not getting a grant but also if you get a grant you can also still ask for feedback um, which is something I didn't realize, which is really helpful. So you can then when you're writing your next grant, you can figure out, okay, these are the really effective sections and, you know, no grant application is ever perfect. So you can always, you can always improve on stuff. Yeah, that's great. I would just add to, to what Aaron said that um, about not all grant reviewers being good people. And as much as we can sometimes learn from the feedback that we get, you will also sometimes get feedback that just seems really off the wall. And that person was probably having a bad day and, or didn't actually read your proposal. So yeah, I would say learn and grow from rejection, but definitely don't take it personally. And if you, so unfortunately, a lot of graduate uh, fellowships and awards won't give you feedback. Some will, but many won't. Um, but if you do get feedback, if you are lucky enough to apply for something that gives you feedback, you can also have somebody else read that feedback. I mean, you should read it yourself. I'm not saying like, don't, you know, don't look it in the eye. Um, but you might get feedback from three different reviewers and there's nobody sort of collating that into one, you know, it's not like getting feedback from an editor at a journal where they're going to have gone through the reader's reports and say, here's what we think are the most critical things. And here's what you probably don't need to worry about. Uh, but you might ask your advisor, your, your primary faculty advisor to do that for you um, or to have somebody else, another colleague or a, a peer mentor, you know, a mentor, somebody that you trust uh, to help you wade through and think about what of that was just somebody being um, in a bad mood or not reading very carefully. And what of that is actually substantive things you should take into account. Well, Dr. Hughes, Dr. Cecil, Aaron, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, this was a great, great discussion. I really appreciate you all making the time for it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good luck with all of your applications.
Thank you and good luck. Yes. Good luck with tenure review. Best wishes there. Yeah. It's exciting. I'm going to. Oh, okay. Well, hey.